Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. This is James Bogart. I am president and CEO of Bogart Wealth. Thanks for taking some time to watch the presentation on how discount rates affect the ExxonMobil lump sum. Um, so Bogart Wealth, uh, we specialize in financial planning, investment management, tax optimization, and tax preparation. Uh, we are what's called a registered investment advisory firm. We're managing uh, approximately $980 million of client assets. It's about 700 households, 90% of which are ExxonMobil. Uh, we are true fiduciaries for our clients, means that we're legally obligated to put uh, your interest above our own. There's no hidden agendas, no conflicts of interest. I have 16 folks on my wealth management and planning team, as well as four on my tax team. I've got three offices, one in McLean, Virginia, one in Houston, Texas, and then one in the Woodlands, Texas. Our mission is to help our clients achieve uh, financial peace of mind by preserving and maximizing intergenerational wealth. You know, what we found is, is that your kids and your parents can be some of the largest variables in anyone's plan. We've made it part of our firm's culture to give them access to certified financial planners. And really the basis behind that is we know the impact that we can have um, early on in someone's life. You know, and that said, you know, one of the calls to actions from any of the presentations that we do is to take us up on the opportunity to do a one-on-one -on -one financial strategy session. It's absolutely no cost, absolutely no obligation. It allows you to get a, a great baseline for where you're at now. Um, you know, one of the things I think in this environment, especially for Exxon Mobil households, you need to be in a position to be able to make decisions quickly, uh, dependent upon you know, various different factors, whether it's something from the company, interest rates, et cetera. Uh, today's talk, uh, it, it's kind of a subset of, of some of the different presentations we do. Uh, we call it our retirement readiness, readiness series. So we do one on the retirement planning timeline, one on retirement income planning, one on social security and social security strategies, one on tax and tax optimization, um, estate planning and estate planning strategies. We do one on net unrealized depreciation and post-retirement income strategies, one on long-term care and long-term care insurance, one on Roth versus traditional 401ks and IRAs. And then recently we added the mega backdoor Roth conversion presentation as well. You know, this, this list came from the audience. So if there's a topic you'd like to hear us uh, address, we're more than delighted to do so. Um, and, and obviously you'll hear some different subsets, things that we're gonna be presenting on uh, with more specific focus. Um, so today we're really gonna be diving into how do discount rates affect the Exxon Mobil lump sum. I am recording this presentation. It'll also be on the website after uh, it's, it's loaded up. Now, uh, administratively, I also have the question and answer box open. If you'd like to ask some questions, I also have the chat box open. I'll do my best to answer those as they come in. And then at the end of the presentation, uh, we do have a, a survey. Love to get feedback. Really like to know what we can do better here or uh, ways of improving, et cetera. So with regards to the uh, ExxonMobil discount rates, uh, a lot of this uh, was, was derived or, or changed based on the Pension Protection Act of 2006. Um, and so we're, we're gonna dive into the different age groups and the different rates, but the Pension Protection Act was designed um, to limit companies that were offering a lump sum option and, and give them a clear set of, of guidelines around what discount rates can be used they also defined what the actuarial tables that, that, that can be used. And then they clarified a few things not necessarily related to the pension program, but they defined that non-spousal beneficiaries can do rollovers. You know, prior to the uh, Pension Protection Act, interestingly enough, it wasn't a spouse. The IRAs or retirement accounts had to be cashed in. You didn't have the mechanism to have a trust or kids, as an example. Um, this clarified all of that. It also clarified that after-tax balances can roll over to a Roth IRA. It clarified that company match, 401k matches can be diversified. And, and some of you might remember prior to 2006, in order to get the extra 1% match within the ExxonMobil 401k, you had to have it all go to stock. Well, this also clarified that you can now have it go into other investments and still get the, the 7%. And then uh, it also defined IRA and 401k contribution limits. But Today, we're really focusing just on the discount rates. Uh, so many of you may know, might not know, but there are two categories of households within the ExxonMobil community um, that are defined based on what discount rates are being used to calculate their lump sum option within their pension program. Uh, the first we're going to talk about is the grandfather category. So the grandfather category is those that were over the age of 50 at the end of 2007 that had more than 10 years of service before January 1st, 2008. 
no change happened here. This is where the old rules were. Uh, some easier ways of describing it is you were uh, at the age of 55 and had 15 years of service by December 31, 2012, or more simply, you were born before 1958 and hired before 1998. Now, for this age group, the math is actually very simple. We use 95% of the 30-year treasury rate, and it gets rounded up or down to the nearest quarter point. Uh, also, for this age group, you use the ExxonMobil year 2000 mortality table. So that's right hasn't been updated in 20 years now. Now, um, related to that, um, here's the trajectory or history off of the 30-year treasury bonds. Uh, it has been a pretty steady downward flow. Now, one of the things that we're modeling is current discount rates, and then also now modeling what it looks like they're gonna look like or, or project to be in the second quarter. So uh, by the way, every single week we send out discount rate updates uh, for both the grandfathered and non-grandfathered um, if you're not on those, please feel free to send me a note. We'll add you to the list. But for the grandfathered category, we know that the fourth quarter as well as the first quarter discount rates were at a new historic low of 1.25%. And now we're modeling or projecting what we're, we're going to anticipate to be the second quarter rates, which does look like they are going to, at, at least at this present time, uh, increase up to 1.5%. Now, the one thing with the grandfather category is we take the entire quarter's average. So October through the end of December are what are determining the discount rates. And we have seen the treasuries notching up here. And so we, we do, uh, excuse me, as of last Friday, have 42 additional trading days within the quarter. And so what we're modeling is in order to see it stay at 1.5, we either need to see rates stay below 1.78 for the rest of the quarter or stay above 1.39. Um, said another way, if rates of the 30-year treasury rates go below 1.39 and stay below 1.39, then the discount rate will stay at 1.25 going into the third, uh, the second quarter, excuse me. So our modeling, our anticipation is that the second quarter discount rate is going to round up to the 1.5. All right, um, I had a question come in. I'll come back and address that in a second. So we also have the other category. This is the everybody else. So more simply, those that were under the age of 50 um, at December 31, 2007, the new pension rules apply based on the Pension Protection Act of 2006. Now, this was anyone who was born after 1957 or hired after 1997. And with this age group, the math is actually a little bit more complicated. So we use three segments that are all based off of high quality corporate bonds. And corporate bonds historically have been higher than treasury bonds. So higher is worse. Um, and, and it's I'll show some illustrations of the three seconds here, three segments here in a second. But the other thing that's notable with this age group was that they're using the IRS mortality tables, which are getting updated every single year. And they are projecting uh, that folks are living longer relative to the grandfather category, which hasn't been updated since 2000, since the year 2000. Now, the three segments, uh, it's segment one, segment two, and segment three. Now, segment one is designed to replicate short-term high-quality corporate bonds. Segment two is designed to replicate intermediate-term corporate bonds. And segment three is designed to uh, replicate, replicate long-term corporate bonds. Now, also, just like with the grandfather category, every single week, we send out projections of what we believe the discount rates are targeted to be going into the preceding quarter. Now, what we do know, and they have been officially announced, is that the first quarter of 2021 is a new historic low for the discount rate. So you can see here, segment one came uh, went from 0.91 down to 0.52. Segment two went from 2.68 down to 2.27. Segment three went from 3.4 down to 3.09. And now we're building in these projections for the second quarter. Now, a couple things to note related to the non-grandfather category. The first month of each quarter has no implications on what the effective official rate is. So said more simply, October really didn't matter. All it indicated was what the trajectory is. November and December, so the last two months of each quarter are gonna determine what the next quarter's rates are. So now that we're in November, we're now building out what the rates are gonna end up being for second quarter of 2021. And so as we look forward, January of 21 is not going to have any impact. February and March will determine the third quarter rate, as an example. 
Now, initially, right now, it is a little premature to call it, but it does look like we've seen a little bit of a trough in discount rates, and we're now starting to see the corporate bond rates uh, increasing as well. Now, to simplify the math, what we've done is, is we created these single rate equivalents for somebody who's retiring at the age of 60 versus somebody who's retiring at the age of 55. And, and to kind of give you an example of what this looks like, this is a very crude example, but it's going to show how those discount rates are impacting someone's lump sum value. So I'm going to model someone who's retiring uh, age 60 using the first quarter discount rates. Their monthly annuity payment is $4,579.33. Annually, it's $54,952. Now, the way that the discount rates are, are impacted is segment one apl applies to the first five years of someone's retirement. So in this person's case, who's retiring at 60, it would apply from age 60 through 64. Then segment two applies to the next 15 years. So it would be from 65 all the way down to age 79. And then segment three applies to, everybody, to everything else. Now, right now, mortality has us going through age 84. So basically, it's applying that somebody who's retiring at the age of 60 is going to have four years of effective exposure to segment three. Now, segment three being long-term bonds, it's the highest of the three. Now, said another way, and going back to the single rate equivalents, the reason that uh, someone's blended single rate equivalent is higher if they're retiring at 55 is because of exactly this example. Now, we've got five more years of exposure to segment three, which is the highest of the three different segments. Now, the whole concept here is that if you were to decide to take the lump sum option, you're now going to have this annuity payment where you otherwise would have an annuity payment, and it's going to be one big lump sum. And so it's discounted back to the present value. And the concept would be is that you need to translate that over into an investment strategy. And the IRS, again, they, they dictated this formula, but it's saying that the first five years would be low risk, which would be why we would use segment one. The next 15 years would be more intermediate term risk, which is why we're using segment two. And then segment three would be long-term risk would be everything else. And that's why we're using the, the higher bonds. Now, what we then wanna look at is sensitivities related to discount rates and how they have an impact on the, the pension program. And, and the reason this matters is because a lot of folks are trying to make decisions related to some of the, the programs that are going on with ExxonMobil. And especially if you're already retirement eligible and we're modeling out, if you're under the age of 60, ExxonMobil does impose a approximately 5% per year discount on your pension program. So if you're going at 55, you're essentially going to only get 75% of what you effectively would get if you waited to 60. Now, my typical rule of thumb is if you're under 60, let's leave the pension program at ExxonMobil. Let's get the guaranteed rate of return, the 5% assuming we expect interest rates to stay flat or go down. If they start to rise, that starts to have an impact on the lump sum value, could reduce what you otherwise would get. And here's just some examples of that. Now, if rates increase, and, and we modeled a, a 10 basis point increase, 25 basis point increase, 50 and 100. You know, general rule of thumb is a 1% movement of, disc, of interest rates either direction is approximately a 10% impact on the lump sum value. So. Here's the technical numbers. If rates went up by 1%, that lump sum is going to drop by 9.5%. If rates go up by uh, 0.25, it's going to drop by exactly 2.5%. The point is, is that as rates rise, even though if you're under the age of 60, you're going to get a little bit of a bump up for keeping it there. If rates rise more than that, you can actually be harming yourself. Now, what we've experienced recently has been rates have been on this, this parabolic movement down, which is what's caused these lump sums to gradually rise and rise and rise. And so now we've seen, for example, in 2020, rates have gone down by over 1%. Well, it's been about 11% translation of the lump sums increasing. So now we're in this predicament of if we're seeing a tropping pattern happening with discount rates, and ultimately they're going to be on a rise from this point forward, we need to make sure we understand the implications of leaving them there. Now, I am not one to ever say you're working for free if interest rates go up. That's not the case because when we're building someone's plan out, we have to look at the impact of continuing having savings, continuing to allow your portfolio to grow, continuing to have years of service, but also the most important impact is not having years of spending. So the whole conversation around pension versus lump sum is only one piece of a puzzle that we're building for someone's retirement plan. We need to understand the implications. 
All right, so I had somebody ask me a question. If I elected to take the pension lump sum on December 1 of 2020 and it was approved, then I can change the pension lump sum to January 1, 2021, since the first quarter of 2021 discount rate is now published. Yes, um, so you, you have the ability to continue to delay commencement of your lump sum option. So we know fourth quarter of 2020 rates were at a new historic low. Now, as of the second week of October, we knew that the first quarter of 2021 discount rates are even lower. You do have the ability to be retired, but to continue to delay commencement of your benefits. So even if you have already effectively submitted a package, if it hasn't been processed, you can pull the package and then delay to get the next quarter's discount rates. Now, that's different than going back to work. Uh, the most critical thing that, that uh, ends employment is when your smart form gets submitted. As soon as a smart form gets submitted, that's irreversible. And, and ultimately, you can't all of a sudden start working again. Um, so it's important to know the differences of the two. And at the same time, also in requesting an intent to retire package doesn't automatically um, mean that you are going to retire either, uh, nor will it disqualify you from receiving the benefits if you are going to take the voluntary retirement program um, as of January 31st of 2021. All right, a couple other things real quickly. Um, when considering to delay the pension, so I already kind of addressed this a little bit. So first off, if you don't need any money right away, if you're retiring before the age of 60 and you're taking the lump sum and expect interest rates to stay flat or continue to go down. Now, in recent environment, we've had some clients of ours that are over the age of 60, but because the rates have been projecting to go down, we've been kicking the can and not executing. Now, because rates are starting to trend up, especially for the ones that are over 60, it's time to go ahead and pull the lump sums. If you're under 60, we got to look at the economics and see what makes the most sense, especially if you're no longer working, right? Because you're not increasing years of service. All you're doing is getting the ancillary benefit of interest rates, um, continuing to reduce some of that discount. All right. So one of the things that we like to do um, as we're doing this process is build out essentially what the roadmap would be. So what we're doing here is giving an illustration of somebody who would have a February 1st of 2021 benefit commencement date. No surprise, it's the first eligible benefit commencement date after the voluntary retirement program. Now, here's some of the critical dates related to that. 120 days out is the earliest that someone can request an intent to retire package. Uh, the company typically recommends anywhere from 90 to 120 days out. Um, and so what that means is October 4th was the soonest somebody who was gonna have a February 1 benefit commencement date could request their package. Now. You are gonna need to inform uh, them of your specific date. So uh, February 1 would be the benefit commencement date. Last day of, of, of working would be January 31st. First day of retirement would be the same as your benefit commencement date in this example, uh, which would then have February 1 as the BCD. Now, the most important date of all of this is when you need to get the package back, which is 35 days prior to your benefit commencement date. So that's listed right down here. So if you're gonna have a February 1 benefit commencement date, that means that you need to have the package back in order to have everything processed on time by February the 28th. Now, I am a big advocate. If you're gonna use a financial advisor, you need that advisor to help them help you with completing this package. You know, I, I like to say my firm and I, we've done hundreds of these now. It's really, really important because when you're going into this, this red zone for retirement, I, I love this football analogy, but again, as you get close on these dates, you're now in the red zone. We need to be making sure that we're executing flawlessly. We're making some irreversible decisions here. So no fumbles, no interceptions. Let's make sure that we are going to be executing this appropriately. Now, for someone who is, is not at a highly compensated or executive level, the package, if you're gonna take the lump sum, has two places that the employee needs to sign and notarize, one for spousal consent. If you And then in addition to that, you need to do a statement of legal uh, residence form. You're also going to want to do a direct deposit form. If you're highly compensated or at the executive level, there's an additional form called the non-qualified pension election form that also needs to be signed and notarized, as well as a direct deposit authorization form also needs to be done. If you're going to take the annuity. Now, the annuity, obviously, discount rates don't have an impact, but if you're going to take the annuity, You'll then need to do the pension election form needs to be signed and notarized. You'll need to do the direct debit, excuse me, uh, direct deposit authorization form. You'll also need to do the statement of legal address as well as tax withholdings. If you have no state impact, then you can ignore the state tax withholdings as well. 
All right, so all of this money starts right on your benefit commencement date. Typically those checks come a few days early. So for example, we just had some November one guys, uh, most of them were in the grandfather category, but uh, their checks all did arrive uh, the day or two before their benefit commencement date of November one. Now we wanna get those into the accounts as soon as possible. So get them into an IRA account with whoever your custodian is. Um, and then once you're now retired is when you have the ability to look at the 401k. It's a totally separate conversation, but I just wanted to map out some of the timing there. Uh, but with the 401k, it does take about four to six weeks to get that rolled over. So it's something that we want to make sure that, that again, we want to be on that call with you, helping to make sure that those are executed appropriately. Uh, unfortunately, with, with Boya, we've had a lot of these have mistakes. I think it's extremely important to have an advisor on the line who knows how to identify those mistakes quickly so that they're fixed, especially if we're looking at doing this towards the end of the year here. I had another question come in. So if I continue working and receiving a salary, isn't the benefit of receiving a paycheck minimizing the penalty since I am 58 and also getting additional years of service really outweigh the slight loss in the lump sum? Absolutely. Yeah. And that goes back to the comment that I was making. Um, if if the, the lump sum conversation is only one piece of this overall decision. And, and yes, if rates start to move up a little bit, especially if you're under 60, there's by no means, please interpret what I was saying as, as you need to go. Um, that's not what I was saying by any means. You know, when I look at a plan, it's really important to understand all of the different components to include continuing to work, increases years of service, it reduces the discount, you're still saving, your portfolio is still growing. Most importantly, you're not spending on your portfolio. All of that needs to be integrated. And, and so many of you have heard my events before. I like to say the financial advisor and us will have you work through 80, you die at 81, your plan's gonna work great. We'll have you save every dollar you make, leave nothing left to live on also will work great. And, and, and obviously it's a terrible joke, but the point is, is the longer you work, the more you're going to have, even if discount rates rise. I mean, the whole concept of working for free, I, I'm not a big fan of, of that saying, you know, because frankly, it, it's, it's not true. Yes, you might be working for marginally less. Um, there is a very, very, very small percentage of the company that are pretty much all in, in Dallas, uh, that the interest rate movement could technically mean they're going to work for free. But again, that's uh, it, it's it's a misnomer at best, and and so I, I I'm not of this mindset, especially with this voluntary program. Anyone who's retirement eligible, it's not exactly a no brainer to go and take it because interest rates are are now projecting to go up a little bit. Um, you know, that's that to me is is kind of short sighted in terms of the analysis. Um, question came in: Does this apply even if we start to see a large increase in interest rates year over year? one, i.e. 1%. 1 so general rule of thumb, right? The answer is yes and no, maybe. It depends on your situation to the, to the question. But if you think about it, 5% a year, and let's just use a very simple illustration. Each quarter, you're getting 0.125 back just for continuing to work the next quarter. Now, it all depends on your situation, your timing, your cash flow needs. But even if rates go up by 1%, let, let's say, for example, in the case of somebody who's got a million dollar lump sum, your salary is probably anywhere from 80 to, to $120,000 a year. 1% movement in interest rates cost you 100 grand. Now, obviously, you're continuing to work, you're continuing to save, you're continuing to have cash flow. And again, you're not spending. So, all of those need to get factored into the timing here as we're looking at this. Now, I still think it's extremely critical to have a plan, I think it's extremely critical to understand the impact. But I'm not going to say a 1% movement is an absolute no-brainer. Yeah, yes, it's going to have a financial impact. And we need to analyze that impact relative to your overall plan. That's what I'm really saying here. All right. So a couple other things to, to talk about here. Um, oh, I had another question come in. So are you saying that if you leave your pension in the plan after your retirement commencement date, you're effectively reducing the discount taken on the lump sum? Yes, I am. Um, if you're under the age of 60. Um, you don't have to continue to work to reduce the discount as long as you don't take the money. Yes, that is what exactly what I'm saying. That'll, that would also be impacted by changing interest rates. Yes, that's also what I'm saying as well. So you can retire. You can leave the, the, the pension program at uh, ExxonMobil. So you can, can, what they call delay commencement. So you could stop working, for example, January 31st, anybody who's under 60. And, and ultimately, if the main driver or reason that you you don't want to go is because you don't want any discount on your pension, you can leave it there. 
My point is, is that if you leave it there, we really need to watch interest rates. We had a lot of folks that ended up retiring in the middle of the summer of 2020 because they were just ready to go. But again, we were seeing the trajectory of discount rates continuing to go down. And because of that, all of them have, have delayed commencement, pushed it out. And so now we're, we're having to look at, at optimization and timing because we are starting to see trend, the trend up. Now, the important thing for the non-grandfathered folks is your benefit commencement date needs to be within the quarter that you're trying to retire in. So a lot of those guys who were in the non-grandfather category, they have to have a March 1 benefit commencement date in order to get the first quarter discount rates. And so it's similar to that roadmap and timeline that I was illustrating, the benefit package needs to be back 35 days prior to the benefit commencement date, which is going to be January 25th. Now, by January approximately 16th, we're going to already know what the second rates are officially. So we're, we're going to have a full arbitrage on this to be able to retire, watch discount rates, and then be able to make an execution decision based upon your particular situation. Um, how many times can you delay commencement? So theoretically, you can actually delay commencement as long as you want. Now, we obviously have to understand the execution here. Now, benefits will tell you that you're only allowed to request a package a certain number of times a year. I, don't hold me to it, but I believe the answer is two. Um, but realistically, if rates move up and you need to take the money, you can take the money. Um, all right, a couple other things to, to just kind of wrap this up today. Um, it's in very important, have a plan. As I said before, Put yourself in a position to make decisions quickly. We don't know the landscape with 100% with visibility of the future. We want to be able to react to whatever the environment is, whether it's interest rates, whether it's anything with the company. We need to understand what your budget is. We need to understand your cash flows, future expense, expenses. We also need to understand your risk profile. You know, If your goals and your time horizon have not changed, your investment profile should not be changing. Your risk profile should always be considering short-term, intermediate, and long-term goals. And frankly, making investment decisions out of fear or greed is not a good long-term investment strategy. All right, we do have a couple of events coming up here. Um, next week, I'm gonna do one on what if retirement comes earlier than expected. After that, uh, I'm gonna redo the retirement planning timeline. By the way, every event that I've done, that I've done on this web portal, We've recorded, they're on our website. Please feel free, go ahead and, and watch them as many times as you want. Um, and then also please uh, feel free, take us up on the opportunity for a one-on-one -on -one financial session. As I mentioned, absolutely no cost, absolutely no obligation. Um, here's our contact information as well. Oh, I'm sorry, I had another question come in real quick. Um, if you have a supplemental plan benefit, how does that discount rate impact? Um, so a supplemental, um, thank you for asking that question, actually. So if you're deemed as highly compensated or you have an executive program, those benefits cannot be delayed. So uh, earlier I had said you can delay the, the, the lump sum. I was specifically talking about the qualified portion. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so if you have a supplemental or a additional payments plan, we need to actually have that, the money uh, executed on the first possible benefit commencement date. So whatever that discount rate is. So for example, if you take the voluntary program, you have to have a February 1 benefit commencement date for any of that supplemental or additional payments plan. Um, and so we'll have to uh, execute a part of the package, but we'll defer commencement on the rest of it because we're delaying. All right. Um, uh, another question had come in. Uh, yeah, we can send out the presentation. I'll send that, uh, no problem. Uh, and then does Bogart have a pension projection tool that can be shared with us that allows the three interest rate inputs? Um, so candidly, I, I mean, we share the results in terms of the data that goes into it. We model these off of using uh, three different input sources. Um, uh, it really wouldn't be something that's easy for us to just give you the the. Uh, actual tool that we're, we've built out because those data sources come in and then there's an impact that's happening because of what the Fed's doing right now with the optimization of discount rates, keeping short-term rates lower. So, um, but I'm happy to talk to you about how we're calculating them and getting these, these projections for you at any point in time. All right. Um, thank you very much. You have a great day. And uh, if there's any questions, this is our contact information. Please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Take care.